two, one. One. Um, I think we are getting close to having admitted all of the participants in the meeting uh, or anyhow registrants. Um, and I would like to then get our meeting underway. Um, my name is Jeff Longadoc and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute. And it's my pleasure to officially welcome you all to this lunch and learn meeting of the Ottawa branch of CASI. One of the benefits of today's online event and environment for all events these days is that the environment facilitates participation by folks no matter where they are. Uh, CASI is a national organization and so every CASI branch meeting can cater to members across the country. And one of the goals we have is in making sure that uh, promotion of, auto, of branch meetings um, is distributed across the country so every all of our members know about these activities and can participate from wherever they may be. Uh, your host today is Jeff Bird, co-chair of the Ottawa branch, long serving and much appreciated. And Jeff will uh, MC the meeting and introduce today's guest speaker. So at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, and welcome everyone. It's, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome Manfred Klein to give the talk today. Uh, the goal of the Ottawa Branch Lunch and Learn activities are to give kind of a compact technical learning opportunity and a chance for people to interchange on that topic. Uh, and we try and keep the topics uh, fairly diverse. So you'll see this one is, is, a, is a bit different, but I think very important. As usual, and I think particularly today, we wanna highlight uh, Canadian innovation and opportunities for people, particularly in these days of, of needing to adapt and to adjust to um, uh, economic and medical uh, requirements. We want to also give you evidence and uh, have an opportunity to discuss how we adapt knowledge, skills, and entrepreneurship to significant issues. And I think today, broader than, than sometimes in the past, this one will cover energy and power in the environment. So I think that's a great opportunity to link the aerospace with some of the, uh, with other broader issues that often we haven't discussed, but I think as uh, we have Manfred here with his unique perspective to be able to give us a background on the engineering side of things, the business adoption of new technologies and, and how best to apply them, uh, even uh, input on standards and R&D investments. So with that short introduction, um, I would hand the floor over to Manfred for his presentation. The chat room is open, so please um, keep your microphones off and do add your questions and comments to the chat room. And thanks for your attention. Manfred, over to you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'll share my screen here. Okay, there you go. And okay, full screen, first slide. Go ahead. Okay, th thanks, Jeff, and thanks to Cassie, and uh, thanks for the uh, attendees who have taken some time at lunch to uh, take a break, hopefully. Um, Hope this gives uh, some examples of, of different uh, aerospace gas turbine type uh, applications. Um, so I, I, I worked with uh, with Jeff Bird at NRC for many years, uh, dealing with uh, these kinds of things as well. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of the uh, examples that I've run across over the last uh, about 40 years of dealing with, uh, with gas turbine systems uh, in the energy industry, um, a little bit with aircraft, but mostly with the energy industry, uh, with the government. Uh, with the National Energy Board, with Environment Canada, and with NRC, uh, lastly. I retired about eight years ago, but I still do a little bit of this with our... We have our G10 gas turbine network that does annual events, and we're a member of that. And uh, so the, the information I provide will be a little bit uh, what we talk about at our G10 conferences 
and training courses uh, over the past number of years. We'll talk about uh, applications in, in, uh, in utilities and industries and pipelines and some of the uh, research and uh, environmental aspects of, uh, of clean energy systems that have, have been using uh, air driven gas turbines uh, uh, for many, many years. So back in, uh, in the mid-1950s, uh, gas turbines were first used on power plants. They weren't really aircraft engines at the time, but that uh, top left picture, 1957, is uh, two ABB 30 megawatt gas turbines in Edmonton, in, in downtown Edmonton. Uh, that was the largest gas turbine plant in the world at the time, uh, replacing the six boilers uh, that you see behind it. Um, and from then on, uh, the, the industry uh, around the world uh, increased its presence in the energy industries uh, across the uh, across various sectors so in the in the mid 60s in the early 60s uh, air derivatives became more popular for various reasons on pipelines at peak power and have progressed into a whole bunch of industrial and utility applications like that list on the left the ones in blue are the ones that uh, are mostly involved with with air derivative gas turbines uh, derived from aircraft engines um, but there's lots of different types of uh, these systems across Canada and the U.S. Uh, about over a thousand units, 1,200 units in Canada. Um, I used to know much more about this when I was uh, actually active in the government, but uh, but my estimates are right now almost 30,000 megawatts is installed. Um, some of it base load, some of it standby, and everywhere in between. And lots of different types of applications. So here are some of the common gas turbine types uh, in Canada used in energy on pipelines, co-gen plants, combined cycles, and whatnot. Um, there's five of them there that uh, are labeled in blue from GE, uh, Rolls-Royce Siemens, uh, that, uh, that are aircraft derivative engines. And that's sort of the topic today. Um, hopefully people in the, uh, in the aircraft aerospace industry are always noticing what's going on with the engines as, as the planes are flying and being serviced. Um, that, that whole industry was the, the forerunner of, of this part of the energy industry in Canada. Here's my estimate of, of some of the, uh, the, the uh, power, um, power outputs of, or, or ratings and types of units across the, across the country. Um, simple cycle, combined cycles, cogens, and, and totals in, in the various types of uh, sectors on, on the left. Uh, gas pipelines and peak power were the two main starting uh, elements of the, uh, of the air derivative engines, but they have, uh, they have progressed into many of the other sectors uh, across the economy. Um, they, the aircraft engines uh, uh, comprise about one third of the total megawatts in Canada, but have contributed quite a bit more in terms of uh, overall technology and research, uh, because a lot of the uh, aircraft uh, uh, technology advances were employed into the industrial heavy frame engines as well, in compressors, combustors, and, and the turbine sections there. So about 30,000 megawatts almost uh, across the country. Um, most of you know about the Brayton cycle, I, I assume in, in, uh, in gas turbine uh, systems, the, uh, the compression, if I run my cursor through here, the initial compression of the air, the heat addition, and the, and the power output. This, uh, this is the uh, power output drive to drive the compressor. And what's remaining there is, uh, is shaft power output at the end. And there's some, some temperature left over for waste heat recovery. All of that work is sort of summarized in this formula of uh, mass flow times CP times delta T. Uh, one of the main things we've been talking about uh, in, in, the, uh, in the courses we do is that the word gas does not refer to the fuel at all. So gas turbine means air. Air is the gas, and uh, so this heat addition can be any type of heat, could be uh, nuclear waste heat, can be solar energy, can be anything that heats up that hot section of the, of the engine. And, and most aircraft engines, of course, use liquid fuel, and most of the uh, industrial systems use natural gas and maybe some hydrogen in the future. But the main part about this is it's, uh, it's power from thin air. I, I asked Herb Servad Muda from Carleton if I could use uh, he had a video many years ago called From Thin Air and that described this industry. So uh, that's sort of the title of uh, what we're doing here. In terms of clean energy, which I dealt with in the government for, for many years, uh, 
This was an early list I put together for types of clean energy that would normally be used in, uh, in various systems. Conservation, renewables, efficient natural gas systems, and, and the other system, nuclear, hydro, coal, gasification. <clears throat> the ones that use the aero derivatives are again in blue. Um, those are pretty important in terms of uh, overall uh, uh, success in promoting clean energy. Clean energy having, to me, five major components to it on the bottom left, uh, air pollutants, greenhouse gas emissions, air toxics, how water is impacted, and energy reliability, security, and resilience. Um, that, that is becoming even more important now in, than some of the other topics in how clean energy is being installed and perceived and operated is that reliability aspect. So what we, we looked at was the, you know, the, uh, if this is the, uh, the, the carbon increase in the world over the next 50 years, 30 to 50 years, <clears throat> I think that these gas driven systems can, can do about one quarter, at least one quarter of the total reduction of, of the various types of carbon emissions. Again, we, we looked at, uh, when I was with Environment Canada, we looked at the, both the air pollutants and the CO2 rates of different types of systems. The, uh, the old steam systems had very high air pollution. The gas turbine systems, when they were efficient, had very low air pollution. In combined cycle, in cogen, uh, some biofuels, and in, in coal gasification. And the, the same uh, degree of, of uh, reduction was available when you're looking at uh, low CO2 solutions. In, in uh, natural gas fuel combined cycles, cogens, <clears throat> and when you when you vaporize coal and capture the carbon, also a very low CO2 amount. So they, these two uh, these two issues defined clean energy in in many ways, and we found that common solutions were available in in different types of gas driven designs and applications. Most of you have seen this from the uh, from the 50s and 60s. I used to have airplane models of all those things when I was a kid. Uh, these represented some of the very first uh, aeroderivative industrial applications uh, that I learned about at, at Carleton University. Um, the small arendas that were installed on the pine tree line in northern Canada to, uh, as an air defense uh, warning, early warning mechanism. Those are some of the old waste heat boilers, a picture of them when they were retired in the mid-1980s. And uh, this was one of the first uh, um, types of cogen plants in Canada in the early 1960s. So just a shout out to uh, why I was involved in this. Uh, so Carleton University had a very strong program and probably still does in mechanical and aerospace. Um, my, last, uh, my last paper I did before I, they, uh, before I left school was uh, this, uh, this uh, essay on, on uh, business jets and engines. And so Herb, uh, Herb Servan-Muru at Carleton, uh, the way he taught and uh, inspired the students, um, I think that was a big success for, for my own career because as soon as I got a job, I realized in, in, in the gas pipeline sector that most pipelines in Canada were being driven by, by gas turbine types of systems. And many of those were air derivatives at the time, the early, uh, the early uh, jet engines uh, from the early 1960s. So uh, a shout out to uh, Herb. Herb also uh, uh, started the uh, industrial applications of gas turbines committee in the early 1970s, which is now called G10. And uh, Herb is back as a member and, and a former co-chair of many of those things. So when I visited these gas pipelines as an NEB pipeline inspector, um, we found uh, a bunch of different uh, uh, early aero derivatives uh, in the eight to 10 megawatt range um, uh, from uh, mo mostly the, the military jets at the time, um, from Miranda, GE and, uh, and Rolls-Royce. And there's an example of uh, of some of those early units, and uh, and um, their you know their pressure ratios were very high. Their efficiencies were in the mid 20 percent range, but they had their uh, their uh, high speed, high flow uh, nature of their uh, of the drive shafts for centrifugal compressors was was quite uh, quite uh, appropriate for for high flow gas pipelines. Uh, notably, Rolls Royce in Montreal and and from the UK installed the very first. Um, uh, a Avon engines in Saskatchewan in uh, 1964. Um, that was a, 
uh, one of the main parts of TransCanada Trans Pipeline's uh, system for many years was uh, was uh, single or dual sets of, of Rolls-Royce Avens uh, throughout uh, throughout the country. Uh, there's this picture I was at uh, in Saskatchewan um, where there was a pair of those and uh, they, they really provide the bulk of service for, for many years in, in getting gas from Western Canada to the East. <clears throat> Canada also has a notable reputation in, in, in the naval industry. Um, part of the uh, the um, success of, of air derivatives was the on on ships where they had a, a you know a small footprint and very high power for for uh, for the um, for the boost systems, and Canada had apparently the very first all gas turbine naval ships in the world, with uh, various Pratt and Whitney engines and a couple of uh, solar Saturns as as gensets, and they were. Um, some of the FT, uh, FT-12s were replaced in 1992 with Allison engines, but these, uh, these uh, complex drives were, were very successful in, in all naval ships in the world now, Canada being one of the first, and, uh, and the part of the, the uh, overall success story of the industry is from the uh, Canadian Navy and, uh, and the like. Mid-1960s, uh, we had power of outages uh, in Eastern North America. And that's where the uh, the air derivatives became um, very important in, in peak power and standby power. Um, whether they were, uh, you know, the older uh, Pratt and Whitney engines or the the newer Rolls Royce engines at the time, um, all these types have uh, have fi figured into the uh, uh, successful uh, reliability of the, of the power grids across the country. Uh, even at the uh, both the coal plants and the, the nuclear stations, all have backup standby uh, generators using gas turbines because of their quick start uh, nature. And uh, so they are part of the, along with uh, so, some of the heavy frames as well, the two in the middle, the uh, Saskatchewan uh, plants, uh, Landis and Meadow Lake are, are frame machines, but together they all work together to um, provide that reliability and standby service. Rolls-Royce in Canada was probably the, the, the biggest uh, uh, contributed to the industry in Canada uh, for, for various types of engines, uh, along with Westinghouse in Hamilton. But the, the, air, the air derivatives were, were uh, developed through the Montreal Lachine uh, plants, uh, and uh, both in, in uh, the first Abens in 64, the, uh, and the first RB211 in 1974 in Saskatchewan as well, along with the research from the National Research Council and, uh, and Rolls-Royce UK and, and the like. Um, there's a sort of a list of, of some of the uh, um, dates of, of certain things uh, happening. Um, so in, five years ago, uh, Siemens Energy acquired Rolls-Royce in Montreal, along with their, uh, their line of uh, compressors and, and, uh, and the Allison end in Indianapolis. So there's a, there was a, like many of the other gas turbine companies, the uh, evolution from, uh, from the original aircraft company to the uh, new energy companies has been a, uh, uh, an emerging story throughout. Technology uh, research and application and implementation. Um, here are some examples of, of some Rolls-Royce enhancements over the years in power and efficiency, which have contributed to some of these uh, successful applications. Uh, research with uh, with uh, groups like the National Research Council and and the uh, OEMs, and uh, along with the aircraft industry, and some of those uh, those advancements have filtered into the heavy frame machines as well, through uh, um, design of uh, compressor blades, the twisted blades that aren't straight anymore to optimize the aerodynamics. Um, a lot of the uh, the mechanical systems uh, for seals and bearings and uh, and materials inside the engine. All have contributed to higher pressure ratios, higher efficiencies, and, and reliability over the years. And then the energy industry took some of that and integrated it into their cogen combined cycle systems um, that are predominant now. An important feature of, of the air derivative engine is, is the high pressure ratio, high efficiency, but it does suffer a little bit on the exhaust temperature. So when you try to build a combined cycle or a cogen plant, because of the high pressure ratio, you get a, a lower exhaust temperature. Herb taught me that very quickly in, in 1980 and some of the other courses that we did with, uh, 
with the various groups. Um, so the, the lower efficiency engines that are, have a lower shaft efficiency uh, with the same turbine temperature will have a higher exhaust temperature for waste to recovery, combined cycles and whatnot. This is an important uh, distinction between aero derivatives and, and frame machines. Um, now, the engine can be fooled by, by managing the airflow through uh, inlet guide vanes and, and, and various uh, twin spool arrangements to um, optimize the, uh, the airflow in the engine to uh, make it seem as if um, the uh, pressure ratio is higher. But uh, there's a, a number of uh, tricks in design that have um, been developed to, uh, to uh, manage the airflow for that kind of purpose. And here's a, a comparison between uh, an aeroderivative and a frame machine, a, a GE, both GE 40 megawatt machines, um, basically uh, showing the steam output, which reflects the exhaust temperature. So the, uh, if you compare the, uh, the steam output uh, at 800 degrees Fahrenheit and 1000 PSI, the, uh, the, the industrial frame has about 50% more steam available in its, uh, in its flow. And, to make up for that, sometimes the the aero the aero drive units use uh, duct burners at the HRSG to uh, increase that exhaust temperature to uh, make additional steam. You can sort of double or triple the steam output by by using using those duct burners and make them equivalent sort of to the uh, to the heavy frame machines. And and this overall efficiency gets gets very good. Here's a, a depiction of a of a of a gas turbine uh, waste heat recovery cogen or combined cycle arrangement. Um, what I've sort of uh, outlined are some of the environmental features of these things. Um, the air filter being the, the biggest and first thing that the engine sees is the massive amount of air coming through. And these, uh, these new air filters uh, clean out that air by over 99% uh, of, of dust is collected in there. And to make sure the engine is is getting is swallowing very clean air, but a number of other uh, aspects that relate to how clean the energy system is for both air pollutants and greenhouse gases, uh, methane, CO2, NOx, particulates, all these uh, um, types of systems will contribute to that the prevention of that environmental impact, along with uh, thermal sizing of the of the engine, picking the right the right machine for the right application. Uh, arranging things to be reliable so they don't shut down unexpectedly, things like that. One thing we did not want in Canada was back in control on what was already a good preventive system. So the, the ammonia injection in, in what we call selective catalytic reduction in the back end to reduce NOx a little bit uh, was not seen as, as a very good system uh, in Canada anyway. It is very common in the States, but in Canada, we don't, uh, we don't think that's a very good way. If, if all the other things are working, then you don't need a toxic uh, chemical in the, in the back of your uh, system. When I left the National Energy Board, my first uh, activity with Environment Canada was, uh, was uh, developing the uh, emission guidelines for stationary gas turbines in Canada. And uh, so we, with a working group in 1991, we looked at uh, various options and instead of using the, the normal PPM concentration based method that the industry used around the world, we decided that, uh, that uh, NOx emissions in, in pounds per megawatt hour or kilograms per megawatt hour, an output based standard using efficiency of the engine was, uh, was the best way to deal with, with promoting waste heat recovery cogen and low CO2 um, with a heat recovery allowance and, and looking at a number of objectives uh, at the bottom there. Certainly operating range, flexibility, reliability, off design conditions, all of those were, were um, considered in how we looked at, at NOx emissions. The lowest NOx number is not necessarily the best environmental number because CO2 and methane are also at play here. And there's a balancing act between, between these things as there's many trade-offs. So in the committee that, that Herb uh, from Carlton started back in the 70s, we now have our gas turbine for energy network, which we, we try to do an annual event, whether it's a course or a, a conference in Banff. It's going to go virtual again this year, probably. But uh, here are some of the topics we, we covered in the last one. 
in 2019 um, around, uh, again, all those uh, environmental issues and industry uh, and economic things around reliability and system efficiency and whatnot. Um, again, invite people to, uh, to go to the website, uh, g10.ca, and see some of the papers. We have uh, papers from the last 10 years almost. Um, it's one of the um, one of the best sources of information for for industrial gas turbine uh, technology uh, applications and science and and research that that you'll find. Again, the uh, the industry really blossomed uh, from the the peak power applications to gas pipelines. So the, our our gas turbine industry grew mostly because of the applications across Canada in BC, uh, in Western Canada and Ontario and using both air derivatives and, and lightweight industrials like solar turbines, but uh, GE and, uh, and uh, Rolls-Royce and a little bit of Pratt & Whitney uh, contributed to all of those uh, applications. Uh, about, uh, again, about 400 units um, uh, of all types and the most common are the, the larger RB211 and LM2500 units uh, from the large civil aircraft that uh, are used on high flow gas pipelines. Um, they are, they are uh, much, much cleaner than reciprocating engines for compression and high flows. And there's lots of different types of examples across the country in that, uh, in that regard. The most common one is the, the, uh, the 25 to 33 megawatt RB211, which is now called the Siemens A35. Um, there's about 80 of these units across Canada most of them in gas pipelines. Unigas have bought a whole bunch of them recently. They're the, one of the biggest uh, recent uh, purchasers of, of the units, but TransCanada is also installing quite a few in Western Canada on, on these uh, big uh, uh, centrifugal pipeline compressors. Um, the efficiencies are, are pretty good. They're around the 40% uh, low he lower heating value range. And um, and there's lots of different applications, both on, on land and on water. The, uh, there's some RB211s on, on a uh, offshore uh, ship platform off of Newfoundland. As well, the LM2500 is also a, uh, an important uh, uh, contributor to the pipeline industry. Um, again, from, from both civil and military uh, turbofan applications, um, it's grown to uh, over 30 megawatts now and um, probably is being used in a more versatile way than the RB211, um, but it, uh, for peak power, for cogens, for uh, offshore platforms and, and pipelines, it's got a, uh, a bit of a wider diversity of applications, um, but uh, there's a, uh, a lot of uh, success stories in how the, uh, the, um, the systems have, have advanced. Um, I note that both, um, both um, RB211s and 2500s have had new dry low NOx combustion systems installed from the mid-1990s uh, to today where they're standard, uh, standard issue. Our CF, uh, CF-18 jets use a uh, F404 engine, which is also used on pipelines as the LM1600 from GE. And uh, we have a station at Stittsville in near Ottawa that has a pair of those. There's about 30 of these across the country in a medium size uh, application, 14 megawatts, high efficiency twin spool again, and um, have contributed a fair amount to the, the, the medium size range of uh, gas pipeline machines. In terms of clean energy, one of the main topics we, we've dealt with in the past is, uh, is combined heat and power uh, and distributed energy. Um, the, the, this gives you the opportunity to become 90% efficient for the power system by using waste heat for, for heating and cooling in, in cities and small industries uh, where the, the power is the byproduct, but the heat is the main, uh, main aspect of that. And uh, basically the waste heat is zero emissions energy. Uh, and uh, it takes a lot of effort to design those systems, but they are will become, I think, very important in terms of of reliability um, adaptation because on-site power is not as uh, as exposed to grid outages from either climate or other disruptions. So we find that um, this kind of system in smaller and medium sizes uh, might be better in future than large combined cycles because they are also an adaptation uh, element to uh, climate extremes 
as well as an efficiency solution as well. Um, for distributed energy, the, the waste heat systems are, uh, are very important for cogen, but also on pipelines. So there's uh, about 15 of these waste heat systems uh, on uh, pipelines across the country in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario that use uh, either steam or organic fluids uh, like butane and pentane in the waste heat system to uh, provide that extra power. So it typically for a, um, a 25 megawatt RB211 or LM2500, you can produce uh, six to eight megawatts of, uh, of electricity from the waste heat system that's used for a local grid. And uh, so the industry was uh, very innovative in the, uh, in the late 1980s till today of using waste heat recovery as one of its main solutions. Um, it's not an easy system to do, but it, uh, it does have the benefits of efficiency, um, a low greenhouse gas profile, and uh, some grid resilience and, and diversity in the local area. So an example of moving forward in terms of distributed energy, um, both from aero derivatives and small industrials, the integration of, of uh, co-generation with public transit and the, the heating and cooling of communities and cities, that's one aspect of, of uh, flexibility, resilience, clean energy, hybrid systems that, uh, that can provide a number of benefits at the same time. And then you also have the transportation sector. So whether it's trains or planes or, or buses, um, or car, the charging of electric vehicles, those kinds of same systems can contribute to that in an integrated way as well. So there's transportation, there's stationary energy, and then there's a number of, uh, of, uh, of other um, things that can be involved from, uh, from hydrogen to, uh, to uh, thermal storage, batteries, various backup systems as a, an overall diverse set of solutions that can uh, can be offered with a range of small and medium-sized gas turbines, which is the, the bread and butter of the, of the air derivative uh, scene. Some examples, again, of, uh, of early uh, air derivative cogens, uh, early 1990s with an LM1600 at a Quebec paper mill, um, and, and some small Allison engines used in small industries in Ontario. So there's a, a number of those the, the air derivatives haven't been as, 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 uh, as often involved in cogen plants because they're a little bit more um, complex. So the, the light industrials have, have taken over most of that business, but there are still some good opportunities for the arrows in, in small industries. Ottawa is, is, is notable for having the very, very first uh, LM6000 uh, from the CF680 uh, uh, turbofan on, on civil aircraft uh, like the 767. Back in 1991, Ottawa installed the first, the world's first 6,000 unit uh, for the hospital on Smythe Road. And uh, it provided energy to uh, a good portion of the hospital, CHEO, the uh, Pearly Veterans Home, um, things like that. Uh, it's got a, a unique steam turbine from Alstom, a two-speed steam turbine. So it was a very unique plant uh, back, in the, uh, back in the day as a cogen plant. It lost its 20-year cogen contract some years ago. It's now more of a peaking plant that doesn't provide as much cogen heat, but it uh, is still a, a big uh, reliability factor in, uh, in the Ottawa area for, for uh, OPG, uh, OPG's grid. And the LM6000 has also been quite successful in, in all sorts of uh, industrial applications. Uh, it's sort of the big brother of the LM2500 and as a, as a twin spool engine, and uh, it's have been used in refineries in the gas processing industry in Alberta uh, notably at the uh, Pearson Airport, there's two LM6000s as you drive out of the airport on the right side that provide uh, uh, heat cooling and power services to the uh, GTA airport and uh, quite a notable project there. So there's uh, uh, quite a few of these involved in, in, uh, in cogens and uh, various uh, applications across the country. Rolls-Royce has a few uh, applications of cogen, uh, not as many as the GED, GE does, but the, uh, the Trent, now A65, uh, also, also the very first application in uh, Whitby, Ontario, for a paper recycling operation using the steam from the uh, HRSG. 
but that was the the first Trent uh, DLE combustion is now a water water injected machine, and there's a uh, another one uh, in a combined cycle in northern Alberta called uh, Bear Creek with TransCanada, again serving a pulp and paper operation with its steam. So the both the Trent and the uh, the, the Trent is the only triple spool engine. The other ones are twin spools, uh, the LM6000 and RB211. Pratt & Whitney is, is more notable for its peak power applications uh, in utilities in, in Quebec and Nova Scotia, and uh, I think in BC as well, uh, with uh, FT4s originally and FT8s uh, today, uh, provide support for, uh, for the, uh, mostly the, the hydro province utility grids that need backup support once in a while on the larger machines. It also was a, a good uh, a good development in the uh, in the early seventies uh, with the the train um, that could have been successful except I think the engine was too fast uh, for for train service in, in Canada so it lasted for a few years but uh, but uh, putting a, a bunch of ST six uh, units in one car um, was was tried for a number of years and and uh, hasn't been used now but maybe there's a future for that as well. In, uh, in using uh, uh, small gas turbines on the on the train or larger gas turbines uh, to produce electricity for an electric train system. Again, Pratt uh, tried to uh, develop some some small one, two, three megawatt uh, types of gas turbines uh, and has sort of held back on the on the business case there because they have to compete with more simple recip engines, which are uh, quite a bit uh, cheaper. And um, so we'll see if those small gas turbines uh, make, make headway in dis distributed energy and, and low carbon solutions in the future. Some other uh, examples of, of small air derivatives from uh, Allied Signal, now Vericor. Uh, Arenda had a biofuel engine in Ontario. Uh, GEM 500 was used in some pipelines in, in Alberta. And the, the Allison engine was quite popular in the 70s. Uh, about uh, two dozen units installed across Canada as well. A notable uh, development in the gas industry was uh, the use of, of pipeline gas transfer compressors when you have to empty one section of, of large diameter pipe, take the methane out and put it into a, into a parallel pipe beside it. These small gas turbines were used uh, in, in those systems uh, to reduce the methane blowdowns, which is an important part of the, of the gas industry's uh, uh, greenhouse gas solution. So this was done in the early mid 80s up to now. There's about 10 of these across the country that use small one, two, three megawatt uh, gas turbines packaged by some, some companies like Interflex on these trailers as portables that drive around uh, and are used in pipeline construction and, and maintenance. The biggest project now in, in Canada, in fact, the biggest project ever private sector Canada in Canada is all the LNG plant in Kitimat, BC, that's uh, supposed to be sending a whole bunch of, uh, of LNG to Asia uh, in a few years. And it's, uh, it's using eventually uh, eight LMS-100 gas turbines, which are a combination of the LM6000 and the GE Frame 6 industrial. So it's a hybrid gas, gas turbine, but the core is the aircraft derivative. And so the first phase will put uh, four units in probably in two years in Kitimat, and then the second phase will put the other four uh, in the plant uh, for refrigeration of the LNG into, uh, or the gas, natural gas into LNG. And the gas pipeline serving it will also be using LM2500 gas turbines from, uh, coming from the Alberta BC border uh, towards, uh, towards Kitimat, probably about, uh, about uh, six or eight units you know, initially, and then up to 20 at, at, full, uh, at full power. But that's the biggest project happening now in Canada with, uh, with that industry. Some other innovations uh, are, are being developed right now on the smaller scale is a, uh, is a battery system in Crossfield, Alberta that is backing up three LM6000s with, with 10 megawatts or four megawatt hours of batteries as a trial for NMAX. The, uh, the utility grid is looking at, uh, at uh, storing energy uh, in batteries to be used with the gas turbines in various types of peaking service and grid support. Um, you can use that, that battery as, as a low emission, a zero emission grid support for, for a short time. So that hybrid will be, uh, will be 
worked on and uh, piloted uh, beginning of, uh, well, mid this year probably. Um, just uh, just north of Calgary, uh, TransCanada Pipelines is putting in a supercritical CO2 waste heat system, which uses instead of the, uh, the pentane butane from the organic Rankine cycle, it will use a, a, a dense CO2 liquid, uh, which is both a liquid and gas at the same time at very high pressure. And it'll be behind an RB211 driven uh, gas compressor uh, in northeast of Saskatchewan using a, a Siemens dresser uh, SCO2 turbine of uh, using the that waste heat coming from uh, the waste heat is is uh, is driving the the, uh, the thermal side and the 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 working fluid in the turbine will be supercritical CO2. Most of you have heard about hydrogen. Uh, a future here's a uh, uh, a graph depiction of, of uh, the the carbon hydrogen ratio from a long time ago, uh, where hydrogen is now uh, sort of. Uh, Around two to one right now in terms of fuels, um, the, met, the future methane industries will be having a, a ratio of, of a, a four to one, and then eventually hydrogen being uh, being by itself. And maybe in, in uh, fifty to sixty years, we'll see how that goes. Um, one of the things about this is that that all fuels burn the vapors, and hard, and both hydrogen and natural gas are already vapors. So, no matter what you burn it always turns into a vapor before it's combusted as part of the combustion process. And, and both methane and hydrogen are already there, which makes them a really big part of the clean energy mix in terms of it doesn't have to transform from a liquid or solid into that gas, makes it a lot more cleaner burning. That's why you have a blue flame. The, the absence of the liquid or, or solid particles uh, gives you that blue flame in the, in the gaseous mixture. And although there's some reliability issues with hydrogen, uh, that's being studied uh, quite closely by most countries now. And um, my role, if I was still with the government, my role would be, uh, would have been, can they balance NOx emissions with low CO2 from hydrogen blended fuels? That will be one of the, uh, the challenges of the, of the industry going forward. Um, certainly, we looked at that when we were looking at coal gasification and synthetic gases from solid and liquids. Um, those were deemed to be you know, very clean fuels for, for gas turbines and, and uh, industrial furnaces. But uh, there are some, some challenges in terms of, of flashback and, uh, and uh, startup issues. Both syngases and hydrogen-based fuels uh, have different flame speeds, different characteristics. Uh, and in order to produce a low knock solution, uh, you need uh, the older style uh, steam injection or, or water injection, maybe nitrogen, to, uh, to keep NOx emissions at, at a reasonable level. The, uh, the safety aspects uh, of when you can't see the flame, the, uh, the flame scanners will not be able to see the flame very easily. So between, the, uh, between that issue and the, um, and the different properties of speed and, uh, and viscosity and temperature, um, that creates quite a challenge to get reliable um, operation on, on hydrogen-based fuels especially if you have to go from, if your target is 50% hydrogen, you still have to be able to operate at 0% hydrogen. Uh, so from between zero and 50, having a, a reliable combustor is, is, is quite a challenge on, on uh, transient operations for sure. Here's some graphs from, uh, from some industries uh, looking at, uh, at the carbon intensity and the, the energy impacts of, uh, of sending uh, hydrogen into the gas pipeline system. Um, carbon emissions are dropping by about one third, typically of the, of the uh, hydrogen percent vo by volume mixture until it reaches a large, so the, the nonlinear characteristics of hydrogen fuels are very important. They're we're gonna find that there is no general uh, rule that will apply. Um, applications will have to be very site specific and equipment specific to uh, be successful, um, but certainly there's between volume blends and energy mass blends, there, there's quite a complicated story in terms of uh, both, both delivery and production of hydrogen, whether it's blue hydrogen uh, for using uh, carbon capture or green hydrogen using nuclear or, or renewable energy to electrolyze it. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges now in, in how that industry will develop. Uh, and that's a, uh, 
something to be uh, to be determined over the next uh, 30 to 40 years. And here are some of the uh, the advancements that might be done um, to uh, allow that to happen again with with uh, with new types of combustors that can deal with blends of various percents and and mass flows all the control systems the safety of the materials from hydrogen embrittlement uh, safety from the aspect of fire detection and uh, and, and the flame properties airflow management um, as a much different uh, lower versus higher heating value because of the hydrogen content of blended fuels so the uh, the amount of water vapor will be higher in the in the exhaust systems and that will affect uh, the cogen potential possibly as well so a number of different changes will have to be done adjustments to to systems to allow for these blended uh, blended fuels and eventually possibly 100 percent hydrogen but I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful about how that will go these engines uh they use a lot of fuel and to be able to provide them with 100 percent hydrogen on a daily basis uh, will be quite a challenge uh, i think a 100 megawatt engine will use about uh, 80 to 90,000 cubic meters of hydrogen per hour so that's that's quite a large amount to uh, be uh, produced economically so just in in uh, in passing um, in concluding uh, i think canada has been a leader in the use of air derivatives uh, i think per capita in the country we have one of the highest rates of the use of air derivative gas turbines versus other things uh, in the world uh, because of the the origins with the pipeline systems and peak power in the, in the 1960s um, their high pressure ratios and efficiency are a big part of, of a successful clean energy program with many with many other applications as well and uh, and certainly there's a lot of uh, room for uh, for research into into flexibility reliability of, of these uh, these things through technology and research manufacturing uh, we invite people to uh, look at our, our G10 network for information and and uh, you can become a member or uh, a participant in some of the uh, some of the working groups. Um, we're trying to establish uh, aero GTs and other things for co-duration applications for clean energy uh, going forward and, and hydrogen and renewables uh, linkages as well with, uh, with various types of systems. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that and uh, and hopefully that was okay and, and people could hear me properly. So I'll just uh, stop there. Manfred, that was great. The uh, sound and the pace and you win the, uh, the big award for completing on time and not rushing through 62 slides in the last four minutes. Thank you. <laughs> we have a, no a number of questions that have come up. I'll start at the beginning. We. We have time this to fit in to we have time this to fit into an hour, but I think Manfred's willing to stay a little bit longer if you want to do that. But we're trying to make this a lunch and learn and kind of fill fill it in. So the first question, first question, lost my chat uh, uh, from. Change since it, from Simon, can you comment uh, on a comparison of total greenhouse gas emissions from various methods of generating electricity? I guess including references back to hydro and nuclear. So the life cycle, you know, there, there, there's a there's an on-site profile and there's a life cycle profile, and and uh, they're two quite different things. So for sure, hydro and nuclear have very small components of greenhouse gases from CO2 and methane, uh, mostly methane and hydro, uh, depending on flooding, how much flooding and, and uh, biomass you're, you're transforming into methane. Um, so those are all very low numbers, close to zero. Um, so the typical uh, gas turbine cogen plant is around 250 kilograms per megawatt hour. And, uh, and that's sort of where, where I feel the... Uh, the, uh, the sweet spot is for gas turbine applications is between two and 300 uh, kilograms per megawatt hour. Uh, coal plants being around 1,000, between 900 and 1,200, depending on the type of coal. Uh, coal gasification is around 800. So the, the use of, uh, of uh, gas turbine systems, uh, you know, there's a very long story there in terms of, uh, I think one of my slides, maybe number 10 or so, had, uh, had a, a simple depiction of that, but uh, 
uh, certainly the, the gas turbine systems have a, a moderate role on the carbon side, but a more important role, I think, on the reliability and diversity side, because they can be mixed with renewables and nuclear and hydro as an integ integrated system. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to comment, and I guess this goes back to reminding me of the of the fun we had working together about the balance of complexity versus sort of ult, ultra clean technology that, that yes, you were talking about two, 200 kilograms per megawatt hour, but if you said, oh, we want to get that down to two, we can do it from an engineering point of view, but do we really want to, or can we really do it? Well, personally, I think one of the big things the world has to do is just stop burning coal. So when you stop burning coal, you're going to reduce CO2 by one third right off the bat. Um, so that, that's a big, a big thing that has to be done quickly. All the other solutions have, have various types of impacts that are moderate and how to deal with them across the board is, is, uh, you know, that's a, a big program, uh, to, to evolve. But, uh, but you want to keep the system safe and reliable and uh, trying to squeeze them too hard. And I think the aircraft industry has seen this. If you squeeze the things too hard uh, with, with small gains, you're sacrificing reliability uh, and safety and, and thereby some economics as well. So there's always a balancing act in engineering. Um, so trying to get, you know, the 80 20 rule that I was taught at Carleton, I think still applies. Maybe it's 90 10. But to get 99% from anything is very, very difficult. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, there's a couple here that are uh, more technical ones. John is asking, how do we detect hydrogen? Is, is hydrogen going to be safe to use around machinery? How do we detect any leaks in systems? Yeah, so hydrogen leaks very quickly and goes upwards. It doesn't hang around much. So if you can ventilate, uh, that's certainly one thing you want to do is to maximize ventilation, I think. Uh, you know, Jeff, uh, in, in, in building uh, M11 that I used to work in, um, they have some test cells that are working with hydrogen. And my office was right above those for a while. And uh, certainly there were a lot of HAZOP studies on trying to minimize both, both the CO from Syngas and the hydrogen fuel that's being tested. Um, I'm sure there are some scanners and some sensors that will chemically detect hydrogen blends, but uh, the, uh, there is a lot of cost involved in, in getting the right materials and the right seals, valves, auxiliary systems to prevent the leakage and um, problems with, with hydrogen-based fuels. Remember that they're mostly gonna be blends for a while. So 10%, 30%, 50%. 100% hydrogen is a, is a very different thing, um, but I'm sure that there are ways to, uh, to deal with that issue. But, but certainly ventilation and awareness of that problem, it will be first and foremost. Thanks. Uh, another question, I guess, similar to that from John as well. What mechanisms are commonly implemented to prevent flashback and detonation when using hydrogen fuel in a gas turbine? So that has not well been established yet. Um, I think that there's a lot of research looking at the, um, the pressure ratio of the gas turbine is involved. The difficulty, you know, DLE con con combustion was a difficult thing, especially on high pressure ratio engines. So flame speed and the, the uh, type of lean premix combustion that was being done, uh, that had its, had its challenges for 20 years. Now we're incorporating a brand new fuel with a high flashback and flame speed and temperature that can, can go backwards into the, uh, towards the, the HPC. And uh, that's gonna have to be solved probably more with, with injecting steam or water or nitrogen uh, to, uh, to, to diffuse that uh, or to prevent that. But there, I'm not sure what the best technology is gonna be. One of the things is, is going to be can you raise NOx emissions to a level that would allow you to use hydrogen properly and safely? To me, there's no good reason to have very low NOx on a hydrogen-based fuel because you're, you're, you're gaining the CO2 decrease at what expense, a little bit of NOx, that would be okay, I think. 
because the engines are pretty clean anyway. Okay. But that's a work in progress from the manufacturers is to get the best way to, uh, to trade off NOx and CO and minimize those combined impacts. Okay, thanks. Question, a question from, from Paul. I don't know whether the, the incorporation of aero, aero derivative gas turbines into the aerodynamics world is on his mind. He wanted you to refresh his memory about why steam was injected in the combustion chamber. Right, so back in the late 80s and early 1990s, before the new combustors arrived, the injection of steam to cool the flame and prevent NOx emissions, the air pollutants, from uh, both natural gas and, and liquid fuels was, was the prominent thing for about 10 years. Uh, except that steam, steam injection took away some of the plant efficiency in some cases. Um, but it was the simplest way to cool the flame to prevent NOx. And as, as I said, it might be used again for the hydrogen blends um, if that can be worked out. But it was a NOx control method. Okay, thanks. Um, just a note from Malcolm. Uh, thanks for your participation, Malcolm. He points out that he found this a fascinating review of applications and technologies and thanks you for his presentation. So I thought I'd inject there. Uh, we have a question from LIGO. Um, I guess similar to the, maybe along the lines of what your question was a couple ago about hydrogen applications. He's wondering, is the fuel gonna be produced on site or off site and transferred and stored? And how uh, is, that, is that going to affect a, a, like a practical application? So that's a really big question being looked at in, in, in all strategies in all countries right now is to how to produce it, where to produce it, and how to manage it. Um, hydrogen is very difficult to send long distances on large pipelines because it uses up a lot of energy. The, uh, the gas compressors have to run at uh, much higher speeds and, and power input. So long distance transportation is a difficult thing. Uh, carbon capture from natural gas. So the steam methane reforming that's being done for most hydrogen today <clears throat> will need, will, may need some carbon capture. And that will limit its application to where you can store uh, car, uh, CO2. Uh, how you produce electrolysis, uh, nuclear energy or off-peak renewables will be another factor in where it's done. So all these uh, choices uh, will become important for different regions of the country and I think that the solutions will be different from for the West, for the Central, and for the Eastern parts of Canada. They'll have different, different arrangements of, of producing it, delivering it, or using it on site. And uh, certainly there'll be some you know, large scale furnaces and power plants that will want to have hydrogen produced close to the, where they're being applied. And uh, so that they can, you can use very high blends of hydrogen versus in a network, you have to keep the blends lower to keep the network safe. So that actually is a huge question and will be the, the, uh, the topic of about 1,000 technical papers in the next uh, 20 years. Thank you. Um, maybe just as a final question, because we often have a lot of students, might you comment on I guess the continued need for what people might have thought are kind of passe subjects and skills in thermodynamics and, you know, those kind of mechanical engineering skills that I think you've shown that there's been tremendous uh, contributions in the past in Canada and that there are, are ongoing challenges even with our major energy transition. But could you have some word of advice for students now about? about building these important fundamental and multidisciplinary skills? Yeah, I guess I do. So my own experience at Cote in, in the 1960s, late 70s was systems analysis. And the, one of the, maybe Jeff saw this as well, um, one of the big uh, parts of, of the education was, was having to take courses in electricity, civil engineering, mechanical, computers, and having to write essays, you know, the, the, arts, the arts courses were important too, and economics and history and all that stuff. So a, a diversity of education, I think, is what is needed for many students now to understand how system integration and, and, and uh, a variety of solutions go into what's needed in a country. 
Um, there's no single thing that will be successful. It'll be a combination of different, different things for different applications. The objectives will have to use uh, economics, reliability, safety, uh, and mechanical efficiency, all those things. Um, you know, as the society tries to electrify, you might find that that total electrification might not be a good thing because if the power goes down and everything's electrical, then you have nothing. So mechanical systems, um, other systems, uh, simpler things, uh, not to say research is important, it, it, it will be important too. So research specialization, but, but also system integration and analysis, I think is one of those things that, that, uh, that Herb and the other professors at Carleton uh, taught us uh, many years ago. Thanks very much. I guess at, at this point to stick to our original schedule, I would uh, thank uh, Manfred for his time and his contributions both in the past and today. Um, I guess we could stay on for a couple of more minutes. There's a couple of more questions there, but uh, at this point, I would like to thank uh, Manfred and thank everybody for their participation. We will be planning uh, an engineering month meeting in March in April, we have uh, Herb Servan and Udo coming back to talk about, I think, 60 or 80 years of gas turbine uh, development. And in May, we have a talk lined up from Pratt Whitney Canada on sustainability. So come back and keep connected to Cassie. Uh, 70 years, Omer reminds me. Herb's not gonna talk about 10 years into the future. <laughs> Well, maybe only 30 years into the future, not 50 years. So thank you, everyone. If, if uh, I see a question from uh, James, uh, if we want to keep uh, answering questions, there's one from James Paddy. Has increased capacity and outputs over the product life cycle of these units real, realized? Uh, has, has it been realized due to increased efficiency, better material design? or different operating envelope, or, or I guess maybe a combination of all of those. So yes, what I said about system integration and, and analysis resulted in those, those, all those things coming together. Um, the materials affects the efficiency, the operation and maintenance affects the efficiency, and, and reliability affects it as well, because all those things work as a system any part of the gas turbine, any, any bolt or, or blade or, or bearing that has a problem will affect the whole system. So uh, the, all the research and manufacturing successes in, in materials, in, in CFD, in airflow design, um, management, um, maintenance, all those things have contributed to, and without, it, without any of them, it could not have been done. It, ha it has to have everything working together at the same time. Thank you. Uh, so that's, I guess, all the questions that I see. Uh, last chance for anyone. Hey, I just wanted to jump in Omer here. Um, Manfred, thank you for your presentation again. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, it was even better the second time around. <laughs> Thanks, Omer. Glad to do it. Okay, with that, I'll, we'll close the afternoon. People who want to see this again and maybe play it for their children or have a family <laughs> video night, there'll be a podcast available for this. So you can re-see Matt Manford and replay the exciting parts and the car chases that were part of his presentation. Thanks again for your time. Uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you for your contributions over the years. It's It's been great reconnecting with you and and I appreciate the unique perspective you've had to keep all of those NRC people honest uh, in doing their work and to keep, to keep uh, helping direct some good work for Canada. Thanks again. Okay, much appreciated, thank you. Thank you, thanks Todd and April and Jeff.